Hey folks, welcome back to Bolts and Brass. This is a special edition. This is not going to be one of my regular videos. This is not going to be anything major uh, content-wise for the channel. This is topical to the day. If you are not a subscriber, please subscribe. If you found my channel because of this topic, and you take a look at my uh, take a look at the rest of my channel, see if it's something you're interested in. Please subscribe, hit like, share the video. Um, it goes a long way. So the topic is the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, and not we're not going to get into the political aspect of it. We're not going to get into the reasons for the invasion or the international response to that. We're literally just going to talk about what I've heard from Ukrainians and other sources about what's actually being seen in reality. We're going to talk about how the fighting is going. Um, and, and keep in mind, this is all second, third hand. None of this is verified. Um, some of it is verifiable if you're willing to put in the effort, but it changes moment to moment. Like it is, I, I can't verify that what I'm saying is still valid by the time you watch this, right? So keep that in mind, but let's go. First, we're going to talk about it from the Russian perspective and or about Russia and things that are going well and going wrong. And to be fair, most of it is going not so well. At the small unit level, Russians appear to be very green, very poorly motivated, poorly led, disorganized, uh, and poorly informed. Uh, I got some information that, particularly for the ones coming into the areas where there were fake separatist movements and Russia false flag incidents, they came in initially thinking they were going to be treated like liberators, uh, that they were going to be uh, welcomed. That obviously did not happen, and they got disabused of that notion rather quickly. Um, I think that given the nature of the Russian military, a lot of this small unit level, I don't want to say incompetence, but, but lack of skill is expected. I don't know why people expected something else. The Russian military at the individual soldier level other than a few specific units, has very little to no experience. The soldiers involved, other than their airborne and special forces units, they're, they're brand new soldiers, effectively. They're the equivalent of taking soldiers out of boot camp. Uh, not even really the equivalent of somebody who's gone through AIT. These are people who are very new to what they're doing. And that is not particularly true of Ukrainian soldiers. And then you have the fact that the officers at that level, and we'll talk about the different tiers of, of Russian officers, but at the individual unit level, small unit level, the lieutenants, the even captains, the captains may have some experience with combat. They may have been rotated through one of the areas that the Russians have troops fighting. But most of those were insurgency style ops or non-peer fights, really. None of their lower-level officers have any experience in a full-out war environment, uh, certainly not against a peer, but this fight is not like anything they've encountered. And I think that this myth that the Russian army is battle-hardened and trained and experienced is just that. It's a myth. Um, it mostly applies to their special forces, the Spetsnaz, and their airborne troops. And neither of those groups are having a great time because they don't have the, the advantages they normally have. They are not in an environment where they control the sky. They are not in an environment where they're fighting disorganized civilian kind of resistance. Um, and they're not operating in the dark, meaning, you know, it's not, they're not operating where they're not known to be there. They're going against forces that know they're there, are willing to shoot, and are well-trained, and do control the sky. So the airborne forces basically are not getting free reign. They aren't coming down where people don't know they're coming, aren't prepared. Uh, I mean, it just, yeah, it's not going their way. Their actual troops have not been in service long enough to build up 
this this backlog of skill and experience like you would see in the U.S. <clears throat> Even in many other countries, if you take British military, uh, Australian, um, you have this institutional history at the small unit level. There are sergeants who pass down things, corporals who've seen you know some service. This this continuous tradition, you don't get that in the Russian military. It's not how they operate. So when when the plan breaks down or you change the plan on short notice, things don't always work out so well. What we're seeing as a result of this, and I'm sure some of this will change over time. Um, officers will get informed from higher. They, they need to be harder on this. But we're seeing a general unwillingness of the infantry to get out of their armored carriers and spread out and support the tanks. They start getting shot at and they they don't want to get out of their protection, right? Because the anti-tank missiles are not wasting their time on the IFVs. They're shooting at the tanks. There are enough Russian tanks that's worthwhile, right? So they're shooting the tanks and the infantry are not as willing, not as quick to deploy and go track down and, and, you know, push out those anti-tank teams. So the anti-tank teams have more time to work. They can deploy to a second, third position, get off more shots. Uh, They don't have to shoot and scoot quite as quickly. What this boils down to is these troops don't have the skill, the motivation, and the leadership to be nearly as effective as was feared, I guess, is the best word for it. Uh, In contrast, I think a lot of people underestimated Ukrainian military. Um, And and this is one time the would be appropriate because most Ukrainians do not like the term the Ukraine. It harkens back to the Soviet era. We don't say the France, the England, you know, the Germany. It's not the Ukraine. Uh, But the Ukrainian military is not a bunch of novices. They are not, you know, some third world country. They're not necessarily a peer country to the U.S., but neither is Russia in terms of their military. Technologically, certain aspects are. In both cases, it's not, it's not just Russia. This is not a war being fought with stealth fighters and, uh, you know, high speed strategic bombers. This is a war being fought literally in trench warfare. Things like javelin missiles are going to be the top end of tech routinely deployed. Electronic warfare to jam communications. But the Ukrainians had a plan for that. They were prepared for the jamming the Russians were going to do. And the Russian jamming is probably not working as well as they hoped because, oh yeah, your jammer has to be close enough to the front to do some good. But if it's that close to the front, we can put a missile in. You know, fair is fair. Um, Russian air power, moving on, right? Russian air power is superior. However, they've only got so much of it there. And it's not winning. It's not losing. But it, they're not getting it all their own way. They don't have full air superiority. They do not have control of the battle space. And that's a major problem for them because it means that they cannot easily deploy troops with helicopters. They can't use their helicopters to break up defenses. They can't indiscriminately use air to ground attack, uh, tactical bombers without losing them, uh, without, you know, attrition. And this isn't World War II. If you lose 10, 20, 30 of your tactical bombers, that's a major chunk of your local force. That's going to seriously hurt your ability to maintain operational effectiveness. And it also affects their ability to move supplies. Because if you're having an effective attack, if you're having an attack that is moving well, you want to resupply that front group. You want to keep them moving. You also want to be able to medevac any troops that get hurt. And the Russian military is horrible about that. But at least the theory, right? Well, if you don't control the airspace, if you don't have full control of that battle space vertically, you can't do that. 
um, you're, this is not going to be the kind of fight where supply chains, as you move forward, are 100% secure unless you dedicate a lot of troops to it. If you dedicate a lot of troops to it, those troops then need supplies. Those troops are going to be under attack. If you have air superiority, you can bypass a lot of that for that frontline troops to keep moving. Without it, you slow, you, you slow down, you, you suffer. Um, I have not got any details about the communications issues. I don't know how well the Russian jamming is working, Ukrainian anti-jamming efforts are working. But we can tell from the results that even if the jamming is working, it isn't crippling Ukrainian response. It is not destroying their ability to defend. So even if it's working, it's not working well enough, right? Um, next on the list for Russia is, let me scroll. The Russian attacks are not coordinated. They are not hitting all in one spot with all of their support, you know, all of their bombardment, all of their air power concentrated. They are on multiple fronts, including a few extra spoiler attacks or whatever they're calling them. You have a main front down south, you have a main front coming into Kiev up north. But it's not one axis of attack, which distributes your ability to support these attacks. It distributes your ability to use your superior firepower in terms of artillery, missile, bombar uh, missile bombardment, aircraft bombardment, uh, air support, just in terms of, you know, hey, if, if Ukrainian bombers are coming, fighter bombers are coming, can we shoot them down? Uh, this is not normal for Russian doctrine. This is actually counter to Russian doctrine, but it is what we're seeing. I don't know why. I don't know when or where that decision was made. They may have expected, and this is, I've talked about this with a few people, and we all agree that it's a logical theory, but we don't have any concrete proof. It may be that the Russians honestly thought the Ukrainian troops would just retreat, collapse, roll over in many locations. You know, that it would be, maybe there's one main axis of defense, but everywhere else it would just kind of roll over. So the theory was, We'll hit them everywhere. They can't be strong everywhere. And we'll break through. That has not worked. And in doing that, they have crippled their main axis of attack in on each front. And brought that to a non-successful attack. You haven't gotten that breakthrough. However, it does lead to my next point before we get onto the Ukrainian side of it. I suspect that the Russian side is going to start facing logistics problems if this doesn't resolve, for lack of a better word, uh, if they don't get the breakthrough soon, if they don't really start seeing the Ukrainian resistance crumble in the next 48 hours. Tanks are going to start breaking down. Um, you know, it just, it's a fact of life. Even the best tanks in the world, you start talking three or four days of combat ops, they need repairs. They, you know, little things start accumulating um, wear and tear. You start having to pull them back for more maintenance. Fuel supplies that you had forward are not sufficient anymore. You have to bring more forward. That puts them at risk. Uh, troops get tired. They, they've been in the field for three or four or five days now. Are they getting good hot meals? Are they getting enough rest? The answer is usually no. Right? I mean, it just it is what it is. You start losing effectiveness after a period of time. And if you don't get that breakthrough, it, it becomes more difficult to take that break. Because if you stop, you give Ukrainian forces a break too. You give them time to reinforce defenses, to move up supplies, to shuffle troops, take a nap, get hot food, you know, get everybody who's got, you know, minor injuries treated and back forward. Uh, so I think that if we don't see a major shift in today, basically, uh, that this could, this could be much more drawn out than the Russians wanted and thought. And that may lead to an interesting situation where it goes to a stalemate, um, because I don't think the Ukraine forces can really, I don't think they have the firepower to push backwards. 
uh, other than locally on an occasional basis. But that doesn't mean they don't have enough firepower and support to hold. So we'll see. A lot of the Ukrainian stuff is going to be much more civilian oriented. I don't have any contacts in the in the Ukrainian military. What I'm hearing is that at least in the areas under threat, civilian supplies are non-existent. Um, you know, it's all bought up. People have stockpiled it. it whatever you've got, you've got. And people were mostly smart about it. Um, I was told that for the most part, anybody shopping in the last two days was just kind of, you know, it was an excuse to go to the store and talk to people. It was an excuse to see what was there. Um, maybe you bought something, maybe not. But it was one last bit of normalcy. But most people either evacuated or are prepared to wait it out. Um, you know, they're, they're in underground shelters. They are in their basement. They are in... Um, you know, areas where there's not expected to be heavier fighting, you know, they're, they're at least they have a plan. It, whether it's a good plan or not is unknown, right? We'll, we'll see how that goes. None of them really came across as feeling like this was, oh my God, you know, Russia's attacking, we're doomed. Most of them were pretty positive about this. Like, this is bad, this is scary, this is, you know, not good. But there wasn't any kind of sense of defeatism. Um, and for the most part, People felt like this too shall pass. You know, we're going to we're going to survive this, and I think that's critical because a lot of the people that were still there, they were evacuating family, they were evacuating you know their kids, their women, older men who physically were not capable of contributing, um, you know, much older, but even the older men who were not necessarily going to be in any condition to fight are staying. You know, if you can help at an aid station, if you can help move supplies, you know, that can contribute. And that's the mentality I'm hearing about. That it's not that necessarily all the adult men are like going forward to the front, but they're helping prepare further positions. They're preparing for the troops fall back to another position. They are helping move materials. They are taking care of things so more soldiers can be soldiers and not be doing things that somebody else can do. So I also think that as the Russians move forward, particularly down south, you may see a whole lot of lost supplies, a um, whole lot of bridges suddenly not there after the Ukraine military has left. They have fallen back, right? But they left a whole bunch of C4 with Ukrainian villagers because something that I think is overlooked in the West, Ukraine is not a third world country. In a lot of ways, they're a first world country. People are very educated. People are very worldly. They're very sophisticated. Uh, I mean, we're not talking Paris here, but this is a trade hub. This is a, a nexus of materials and goods flowing through the region, which is part of why Russia wants it. Um, you know, regardless of the whole, well, we don't want NATO on our southern border, blah, blah, blah. A lot of this is they're in a very strategic spot and they know it. And it means that their population is not a bunch of, you know, backwoods hillbillies. These are people who, you know, if a trained engineer says, you know, put the bombs in these kind of spots and here's how you rig it, here's how you set it. That person can interpolate that to a particular bridge. They don't need trained on put it right here on this bridge. You can give them general knowledge and they can apply that. They can use their own initiative. They can read, write. I mean, like things that, that a lot of villagers may not be able to do in a third world country. These people can, and very often they can read and write Russian. So if you're that Russian supply convoy that is not well guarded and you suddenly get stopped by somebody who looks like a Russian at a bridge saying, hey, there's a problem with the bridge, you know, hold up a minute. Um, you know, we need to check the weights on your vehicle so that you don't break the bridge and so on. 
and suddenly you've got a whole bunch of guns in your face. Um, well, those Ukrainian people, these are not soldiers necessarily. These are people who you know are, are locals. They can read your manifest and go, we're taking that, we're taking that, we're taking that, we're blowing up the rest. And by the way, we're going to use your explosives to blow it up. That's a thing. These are not stupid people. These are not ignorant people. These are worldly people. So I don't think this is going to go the way the Russians expect. The Russian government has very much presented this to their people as liberating Russian sympathizing people. Um, you know, that, that's what all these false flag attacks were about. All these attacks that they were manufacturing were trying to make it look like there were groups trying to basically secede from Ukraine. But it was all fake. And it's becoming quickly apparent that it was all fake. And the Russian population, at least the urban one, is seeing this in real time. They aren't happy. That's why we're seeing all those protests in Russia. Short term, Putin can ignore that. Uh, he, he has that ability. He is a dictatorship for all intents and purposes. He can ignore that. Long term, this drastically affects his ability to operate the country if his popularity falls rapidly, right? Um, it's not that simple. He can't just ignore it. Years and years of preparation for this is getting thrown out the window in days. And I think that that will also operate to create a problem long term. If this goes on more than a couple more days, that kind of thing will actually apply more pressure than all these external sanctions that would take months or years to actually have any influence, even assuming Putin cared. Honestly, I do not think this is going to go as well for Russia as the Western media has made it look. The Western militaries may have thought, I think that Ukraine is a much tougher nut to crack than anybody suspected who was not familiar with them. Um, I think the Russian military gets a reputation that is largely undeserved um, as a large force, as a massive power. Absolutely, they're, they're powerful. They have some great equipment. But at the individual soldier level, at the level of we're fighting for a trench, we're fighting for this block, I don't think they're nearly as competent as people think. And we're seeing the result of that. We're seeing that when it comes down to fighting for somebody's home, fighting for somebody's neighborhood, the Russian military is not up to that task. I don't think they're even as up to that task as our military was when we invaded um, Afghanistan and then Iraq. Our military at least has serious training in these things. We had units that specialized in it and started the ball rolling and then passed that knowledge and experience down. Russia's getting that experience on the fly and there's not going to be any time or space from the pass that knowledge down. That's not going to work for them. Their troops are learning on the job and paying for it. So that is it. Um, take care. Have fun. Uh, Ukraine, keep up the good fight and wish you the best.